Let's drop the green flag on this episode of the Talent Tank Podcast with your host, Wyatt Pemberton, bringing you the best, fastest, most knowledgeable personalities in Ultra 4 and off-road racing. Okay, here we go. Welcome back to the Talent Tank. As you clicked on this episode... We've got Lauren Healy, two-time King of the Hammers champion, sitting here with us uh, after you know a long couple weeks for him. Certainly a long day yesterday for him. This is the day after Ridgecrest when we're taping this. But we're going to kind of roll into it. Lauren, good morning, and welcome to the Talent Tank. Good morning, everybody. Uh, super excited to be here and looking forward to diving into some good stuff with Wyatt. So, Lauren, uh, I'm going to just set the hook right here. Who wins King of the Hammers 4400 class this year? Me. <laughs> it's, okay. always, it's, it's always me. Until, you have uh, to say that. And, and, until it's not, absolutely. Who is it if it's not you? Man, Paul Herschel's on a tear right now. Um, the, the boy's killing it. Uh, he can't take Shear out. Uh, that, it seems to be his only focus is King of the Hammers. Doesn't care about anything else. You know, and, and then the other usual uh, heavy hitters is, is always Eric, you know, Slauson, uh, you know, the, the normal Kings. There, there's a couple people that can sneak in. I really think it's Herschel, Derek West, you know, a, a couple of those guys that have the have the talent to do it, just haven't had the luck. So I, I don't think it'll be anybody new if uh, unless it's Paul or Derek. All right, that's that's fair. I mean, you snuck in there in 2010, so yep, <laughs> things are a little different now. I had to sneak that in there. For, you know, I, I had to know kind of where you stood on this in the beginning. <laughs> Let's talk about who is Lauren Healy. How did uh, we get to where today Lauren is a professional race car driver? That's all he does all day, every day. I say professional race car driver. He's a professional everything. He does uh, car prep, works on his cars, does his own marketing, uh, works with his sponsors, works with uh, his partners. And then 1% of the time, he actually gets to put on a helmet and uh, hold a steering wheel. So we're going to dive into that world of what it took this guy to go through his life and get to the point where this is uh, his work hat's a helmet and uh, and he puts down a visor to do work. So here we go. So Lauren, you're a New Mexico guy. I think uh, you live in Farmington and tell me all about Farmington. And I believe you also grew up there. Is that correct? Yeah, I did. You know, Farmington was kind of part of the birth of rock crawling and uh, what we followed as as teenagers and in high school, you know, we would watch Shannon Campbell and Tracy Jordan and those guys come do the competitive rock crawling here in Farmington. And so that's what we did on the weekends. That was our hobby, our passion. You know, we built Jeeps and we built buggies and, and you know, Friday nights and the weekends and we traveled around the country and we just we just went wheeling. It was, it was what we loved and, and uh, kind of where we got our start a little bit. Never had done any racing, never had even tried to do anything competitive until King of the Hammers. And, you know, we went out there in 2009, kind of off a whim when Dave Cole showed up in our backyard as a rock crawler, telling us about the, all this crazy King of the Hammers stuff. And, and so we had to go try it. You know, it was what we were doing every weekend. We were racing out to the trails, hanging out with a group of buddies, see who, seeing who could climb the stupidest, dumbest stuff. And, uh, you know, it just, it just evolved into what King of the Hammers was and what they were doing at that time. And so we went out to Johnson Valley in 2009, uh, took, took basically, basically a rock crawler out there and, you know, broke it in half in like three miles, but we, we qualified like top two, you know, with no racing experience and, uh, and just set the hooks, as as you'd say, uh, it, it kind of ruined my life. My whole, it, it set the direction for where me and my family and my friends and everybody were headed for, for the next, you know, 10 or 15 years. Which is, which is a great segue to let's talk about your friends and family. And actually, when you first started wheeling, I, I think a lot of the places you went was in your backyard was Choke Cherry Canyon. I think it's named after a highway, but you're going to have to tell me it was. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's the highway trail and I can literally throw it um, from throw a rock from my house to, to hit it. You know, I, I built my house right on the edge of Choke Cherry Canyon because that's what we were doing every single weekend was was wheeling in Choke Cherry Canyon. And, you know, we, we broke some some amazing stuff out there. And yeah, just, you know, that's that's what we were doing was the, the hardcore scene. And, and it's really uh, reemerged a lot with with Kevin Carroll and what he did with the red dot cars. You know, it died off a little bit when King of the Hammers kind of came in. But, you know, the hardcore wheeling scene with all the rear steer cars and stuff, you know, I just built another one for the first time in, you know, in 10 years because because it's just it's been a lot of fun. And and it's cool to see everybody doing these crazy lines and, and climbing crazy stuff that, that didn't used to be possible. 
Well, isn't isn't choke, cher- choke cherry like the the terrain? The rocks are like you know like a slick rock. It's like super super tacky, like massive amounts of traction. You can I've seen pictures, video, vertical climbs are not out of the normal for you guys. Like straight, almost vertical. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. There's traction in Farmington that you won't find any anywhere else in the world. So you do get to do these crazy insane insane climbs that yeah you're you're not going to get that kind of traction in Johnson Valley or anywhere else in the world for that matter. So when you first started, uh, first started wheeling, were you and you and your wife together by then, or is this uh, you? You met her along the way, had kids along the way. How did how does the family life play into uh, the motorsports? Yeah, no, I mean, I I met her along the way. You know, I uh, in high school I had an old Scout. You know, that's what I started in was an old seventy six Scout, and I'd go break it every weekend and have to work on it all all week. You know, to to be able to drive it to school or to drive it to work or to drive it to sports. So. Um, you know, that, that started my passion kind of evolved into a Jeep while I was going to college and going to school. And that's where, that's when I had met my wife, you know, and she just, she was super supportive of, of what I like to do as my hobby. You know, I could have been, you know, hanging out in strip clubs or in the bar and partying or something, but instead we were in the garage working on Jeeps and, and, uh, out wheeling on the weekends. So I think, you know, that was a pretty good trade off. Yeah. I think you found a, a good partner if that's what the deciding factors are clearly is why she's still with you over, uh how many miles out of the year you put on a, a toter and a truck and a trailer and certainly all of, all of that to end up where you are today. So you, uh, you sent me some, some info about you and I'm totally intrigued by this. When you went to college, you worked at Olive Garden. <laughs> Everybody gets hung up on that a little bit. They, they think it's pretty funny. I, so, you know, go to college. I needed a way to, to make money and support myself while going through college. And, uh, you know, when I was 19, waiting tables was, was a great way to do it. I would uh, go to college during the day and I'd wait tables at night and my wife would do the same thing. And, you know, we got a few days off here and there together to, to go wheeling. But, you know, it was full time college during the day and then uh, straight straight to work at night to support myself. I, I think everybody should wait tables at some point in their life to learn how to deal with the general public, to learn how kind of rude and nasty people can be. But, you know, to always keep a smile on your face and always stay positive and be ready for the next situation. But so I did that for seven or eight years down in Albuquerque while while going through college. Um, in the end, I was working towards a business degree and got talked into managing an Olive Garden there at the end. You know, you're 23, 24 years old and they throw out, you know, 50 or $60,000 to be a manager. <laughs> and you just, I, I thought I was killing it. So that lasted for a couple of years. I realized I definitely didn't want to be part of the restaurant in- industry for the rest of my life. Great learning experience, learned from some, some great business experiences there. But, uh, Moved back to Farmington where all my friends were, were living and they were all just killing it in the oil and gas industry. You know, it was, it was a huge boom at that time, you know, the early 2000s. And, and I, I moved back and uh, wanted to be a part of it. To go back to, to go back to Olive Garden, I, and you said that's a good experience. I would actually, you know, even throw in there that your experience there is this is proof to everybody that you can literally be whatever you want to be and you can start show that you've came from humble roots that you started uh waiting tables and then now you're like i said you're you appear to have the dream job and everyone seems to you know envy that like oh if i could be a professional race car driver and lauren is sitting over here going you know what i've worked really hard for it i've you know i didn't just become a success overnight you know i've I've worked on this and i worked my way all the way up from the bottom and here i am today to tell you that you set your own trajectory. You, through hard work, you can get here. And that's what I love about your story. That's what I love about you. That's why I've always been, you know, a, a super Lorne fan over here, you know, like a cheerleader. <laughs> so, so after Olive Garden, you end up back in Albuquerque and you're working in oil and gas. What is the field there? It's the Rockies, the Permian. It's not Permian. It's right. Yeah. It's Rockies gas. Yeah. It's, it's Rockies gas. So we, my wife and I, we moved back to Farmington, New Mexico. Um, we just had my first daughter. She was one year old and uh, my wife was soon pregnant with my second daughter. So, so, yeah, I, I started working in the oil and gas industry. You know, luckily, uh, my business degree was helped me get a good position. And, and I ended up in management at Core Laboratories fairly quickly after learning the roots and, and learning the field side of it. But, uh, you know, worked there for 10 years and it was, you know, setting the pace for for kind of the hustle. Um, oil and gas industry, everybody thinks it's great money and super easy. But I was traveling really heavy to to keep up with work and then, you know, trying to uh, to start a race team at the same time. So, you know, I'd come home from traveling down to Midland, Texas to work all week and I'd uh, have to 
work all weekend to get a race car ready and, and try to go racing. So, you know, it's kind of always been a, I've got two or three jobs type thing, plus trying to keep a family and balance it all. You know, super grateful for, for working 10 years in the oil and gas industry. Definitely taught me a lot and just great experience for learning how to mechanic, learning how to, you know, manage time and, and learning the hustle for sure. So what exactly did you do at Core Labs? So uh, Core Lab was a, is a reservoir optimization company. They do all kinds of different oil and gas stuff. Um, I worked for ProTechnics, which uh, that division, we did downhole logging tools. We did frack tracers and some other core stuff. So when I started, I started as a frack tracer chasing frack crews around the country. And, you know, we would inject different chemicals, uh, actually uh, radioactive tracers that, that logging tools could go and pick up and I learned that first, then went over and learned the logging side of the business where we were running logging tools off of slick line and e-line, stuff like that, and then got moved into into management because I knew the, the whole company and the whole business. So for that underground mapping or whatever, is that what it was? You guys were able to map reservoirs? Yeah, was, we'd go in on new drill wells and, and give companies more information on you know how to better build the next well or how they could go back in and refrack a well that they didn't get the penetration that they expected or you know that type of stuff or, or flow back samples to know what they were getting in flow back. So. Giving them more data points to, to certainly analyze any of their downhole work. Yep, engineers love data. <laughs> For sure. Right. They absolutely do. And so you were predominantly onshore though, right? I was. I only went offshore a couple of times. Uh, the boom, it's, so when I was starting to leave, the boom had kind of fallen off. Definitely in the Rockies, you know, natural gas prices were down. And so it was, it was really tapering off in the Rockies. The Permian was still hitting pretty hard, but... So I was just starting to get out, go offshore. I had to do my like helicopter egress training where they step you upside down in a helicopter tank in the water and you had to jump out of, out the windows. Like I had just been trained to go offshore, uh, did it once or twice and, and pretty much set the tone that I didn't want to be doing that anymore. I was sick of the traveling. I was racing pretty professionally at that time. You know, it's been about two years now. So I, I was traveling pretty hard, you know, doing all the marketing, doing all the stuff for my race team that that I, that I do today. But it just it wasn't working out. I was I was doing both of them kind of half ass, so to speak. Like I couldn't focus on either one of them, and knew it, it was either kind of time to to jump and and take this risk of racing full time. You know, the budget with it was there, but you know, the having a family and having three kids and having all that. It was scary. You know, if I was still 22 years old and, and didn't have any responsibility, man, I'd have jumped a long time ago. But to, to do it with wife and kids and responsibilities and, man, where are we going to get insurance? What all, all the all the pieces of the puzzle was scary. But, you know, as you, you got to be willing to take that risk at some point in your life, I guess. No, yeah, absolutely. Before we get back to where we do a, like a flashback to 2009, 2010, you starting to race KOH style stuff. Obviously, you must have had a very good boss, a very good manager that let you take off a lot of time to, to get racing, right? Tell me about that support in the workplace. Yeah, I did. Um, my bosses were always very supportive of it. And with the with the position that I had with management, you know, I, I had a lot of flexibility and a lot of free time. Um, I was on call 24-7, so when they called, I had to go. But there was free time, you know, during the day or in the evenings and that type of stuff to work on the race cars and, and run the race team. But, you know, I had been there for 10 years, so I had like four weeks a year of, of vacation and, you know, could kind of string some Fridays and some Mondays together with races where – it ha it did provide me a lot of flexibility and, you know, a good budget to be able to, to do the stuff we were wanting to do. But yeah, I'm, I loved everybody over at Core Lab and, and I think I left on great terms and co probably would be welcome back with open arms if I ever just, you know, needed to go back to the oil field. Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully not. So, hey, Choke Cherry Crawlers, 667 Rockers, 2009, your first Fourier into King of the Hammers, you guys came out, showed up in Johnson Valley, got hooked, got bit. And then you came back, came back to Farmington, and then what? You were already buddies with Randy Rod. Tell me about that. <laughs> how did how did you you know be be so lucky to end up wanting to do what you want to do and be you know just a handful of miles, a lot of miles down the road from Randy and what Randy had going. So Randy's about an hour away from me at Jimmy's Four by Four, and early on. I was having him cut up a old TJ for me. You know, I had bought it during college and that was my evolution of my hardcore wheeling rig. Um, I'd wrecked it in Moab and took it to Randy and said, Hey, you know, can, can you cut this up and stretch it and let's put an Atlas in it. And, you know, I want to be able to do the more hardcore stuff in this Jeep. 
And so he had it for a couple of weeks and he calls me and there was a tube chassis sitting there on the floor that was a Raven racing chassis that was supposed to be for cotton or, you know, I don't know, remember the exact story, but while I was there, you know, I'm eyeballing it. I'm like, man, maybe I just need a hardcore trail buggy, but I'm, I'm in college. I'm working at Olive Garden. I, I don't have, you know, 20 or $30,000 to sit in my bank account to build this, this trail buggy. And he calls me a couple of weeks later and he says, Hey, you know, I've got a smoking deal. Let's, let's put some parts into that rock crawler buggy. You know, I want, I want to see you do cool stuff in this buggy and made me a screaming deal on it where, where it was something that I could actually afford to do, you know, at, at 23 years old or however old I was in college. About what year was this? Man, I ha- it had to have been 2000, 2005, probably somewhere in there. Come to find out, he had taken my Jeep out and rolled it and totaled it <laughs> <laughs> and didn't tell me. So he just calls me and makes wants to make me this screaming deal of of he's going to build me this buggy and and looks like the super nice guy that he's just helping me out. And, and you know, we became great friends since then. Um, huge part of my career. He's built all my race cars, all my trail cars, all my Jeeps. He's, he's built everything and done everything for me. Um, you know, definitely part of my family. And it was just, you know, five years down the road, he's like, Hey, I got to tell you a story about your Jeep, you know, of, of why we really built you that buggy back in the day. So we all had a, had a laugh about it and giggled. And, and, uh, that was, that was the start of me and Randy and Jimmy's four by four. And that's the, that's the early years of the Jimmy's army. It definitely is. He was in a two bay shop on the backside of his dad's transmission shop. And, you know, he built a couple cars. That was the XRA days. So he was, him and Cotton were racing XRA, you know, against Shannon and Rick Dermo and all those guys. You know, that was, that was the, the cool thing in the sport back then. You know, three or four years, I'd been hardcore wheeling this buggy and, and, you know, told him that I wanted to go out to King of the Hammers. And of course he jumped right in to support it and, and said, let's do it. Let's, let's make it happen. And yeah, by, by that time, Randy had a couple of cars that were already kind of in King of the Hammers. He had, you know, Derek West was, uh, had been running a Jimmy's car for four or five years at that point. There's just quite a few Jimmy's cars that were out there. So it was not a surprise to see more Jimmy's cars showing up. And again, seeing more, more show up today. I mean, we saw David Hartman won yesterday in 4800 at Ridgecrest. Took a Jimmy's car. He's a fairly a, a rookie driver with getting experience. But Randy and what they've done at Jimmy's have really put together a formula uh, of success with you always knocking on the door uh, to win. Derek West is always a contender, like you mentioned early on. I'd been to Randy's old shop there in uh, Cortez, and I've been to his new shop. Actually, when you're building the Dragon, we'll talk about the Dragon here in a little bit. But, yeah, that's Randy has been a pillar and centric to many, many people's careers, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think we've all kind of grown together. You know, he was in this little shop and then we went and won King of the Hammers and, and a lot of people, you know, he's, he's great at building cars and has, has a great passion for it. And, you know, it just kind of helped all of us grow together and turn, turn the Jimmy's army into what it is now for sure. So that first trail car you had that, you know, started in 05, 06. So let's go to 09. You guys go to KOH. You took that car to KOH and then what you built a new one. So yeah, 2009, um, I'd been beating on that trail car for all these years and Randy says, well, let's put you in one of my new chassis, but I didn't have the money to, to go off and build a full race car, you know, and, and didn't know that I really wanted to commit to it, but I'm like, let's go try this. So, you know, I saved up a few bucks. Let's put all the parts from this old trail buggy, which is, uh, the number one no, no in, in off-roading racing is taking all these used beat up parts from a trail car that have been just beat to death for five years. And we put it into a chassis. It literally broke in half and, you know, not the chassis, but all the parts were just scattered like eight miles into King of the Hammers. I mean, it, we had broke through the seats and landed on the muffler. So Rodney and I, we've got smoke coming into the cab because our seats are on fire. Everything's vapor locking. And then we we made it back to the first pit, which was like eight or ten miles back in those days. And I neutral dropped the transmission to try to get it to into the pits and and broke the output shaft in the transmission. And that was my first experience with King of the Hammers. You know, uh, made it eight miles, but qualified well, was hooked, and went home and took out a second mortgage on my house to build a real race car like an idiot. And then that car, so that would have been yeah. So we're talking two thousand ten. Yeah, so so late two thousand nine when you were building that car, right? Yeah, late 2009 when we when we I went back and talked to Randy and like, man, I'm hooked. Let's figure out how to build a real race car with real race car parts and and see what we can't figure out. And then you took that car, if I recall, this is my memory only, that you took that car out to a, like a West Texas or like a New Mexico desert race, a 180 or a 250 mile race, and won like against 
you showed up with this four wheel drive car way before anyone had done anything really. Well, I say anything at 2009 Vegas to Reno when the 4400 class was you know, registered with best in the desert. There hadn't been four wheel drive cars showing up at desert races. And then all of a sudden you show up at this one and you smoke everyone. Is that my memory correct on that? Yeah, that's true. So yeah, I mean, I, I raced nine miles at King of the Hammers and got hooked and that was my first racing experience. And so we go back and we have Jimmy's build as this, this real race truck and it's still on a budget. You know, we, I think I spent $52,000 building that first King of the Hammers car for me. That was a real race car. And so we wanted to go out and get a shakedown on it. We took it, um, went, went to this, uh, they call them New Mexico outlaw desert racing. And, and we did, we took the overall, uh, beaten, you know, some class sevens and, uh, 1400s and some heavy trucks. And, um, I don't think there was any real trophy trucks there. So I don't, I don't think I'd go and say that we beat up on trophy trucks, but we did. We went and took the overall at, at the first desert race. You know, the, the crazy thing was then was, we didn't understand what race car prep was. We had no clue. And so we went home, changed the oil, washed, washed the dirt off of it and took it to King of Hammers. One King of the Hammers did the exact same thing, went home, washed the dirt off of the dust off of it and took it to Silver State and won Silver State. Like <laughs> it was just, it, it was a pretty wild ride in 2010 for sure. So you won three back to back entries. And so you already had the taste of the back to back wins before we even got the Red Dragon showing up in 2014, 2015, right? I think I even won one more race that year, won the championship, and it did. It just hooked me. If I had, if I would have had a bad year, or if I hadn't beat Brad Lovell for King of the Hammers, you know, what was it by 28 seconds? I, I probably would have gave up. I think I just got lucky early on enough. The competition's so tough now that it's just that's not an option for a rookie to come in and do something like that. But it just. It changed my whole life for sure. Definitely set the tone. I mean, you bring it up the 20 seconds in 2010. I mean, to think about the length of that race coming in and winning just by 20 seconds, but there was three cars that came in all together and you didn't come in first. You, you came in, you were like second, but you won on corrected time. Was that Brad was first in and then was it, was it Derek West behind you? Mooneyham was there too. Oh, that's right. That's right. Derek was close too. I think I beat, I think Derek ended up fourth maybe, but yeah, we were all within um, a minute or two of each other. We were all coming through spooners together, passing each other. I had no clue. You know, those years were random draw. There wasn't really a qualifying. There was an LCQ that we had to get in through on the LCQ. Yeah, there wasn't qualifying. So you just random drew. So we started 52nd or something like that. And we didn't know how to keep track of time or where we were at or anything. We just, we just knew that we came in in the top three or four spots and, and then they announced it that, you know, by 28 seconds that we had won the overall. My, how times have changed in about 10 years on timing and knowing where you stand on the track, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And they're in there with their stopwatches and Jeff Noel and Dave Cole are, are trying to add up and do the math. And who knows? They're probably wrong. I probably didn't even win the damn race. <laughs> well, yeah. well, I mean, we won't say that now. I mean, we'll wait at least 10 <laughs> years. So the statute of limitations is out on that. Right. Where Brad or Easy Rick can't come back and, uh, and dispute it and say, Lauren even said he didn't win in 2010. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to take some credit for it because the night before that race, uh, I remember uh, making you, it was more or less forcing you to drink some moonshine. Uh, yeah, I think you've done that at more than one race. Uh, <laughs> you and Miles and, and everybody else seems to have a moonshine for me. But <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, we we were there to party and have fun and, and uh, live the off-road lifestyle at that point. So, you know, things are definitely different now. There's not much uh, hanging out and not much campfire time. And uh, it's all business at King of the Hammers now. That That's the roots and that's where it all started. That campfire and hanging out stuff, it still happens. You just... Or asleep by then because you're so old. <laughs> I am. My crew's down there hanging out and having fun, but I am in bed from hustling from five in the morning. <laughs> so we had, this is 2010. You had some moderate success, you know, leading up to 2014. Then you showed up in 2014 in, with another new car. You'd shaken it down a little bit before then, and you won. You won your second scepter. So we went home, and after 2011, so we win King of the Hammers in 2010, and and so the the sponsors and the partners start calling and say, hey, we'll give you like five or ten grand to to brand your car. Well, five or ten grand doesn't go very far, but I thought, oh man, I'm making it now. It's it's time for sponsors, and and I'm going to be a race car driver. So we get all these new partners. Some of them are amazing. Some of them are still with me. Um, KMC Wheels has been with me since the very first year. Chris Anderson called me and and wanted to help me. I learned a very hard lesson. We sold that race car that I won in 2010 because we're thinking we got some budget and we got all these sponsors coming in that want to help us with parts. And so I learned really quickly that they all wanted to give me parts that were test parts that weren't going to hold up. So we go home, 
sell that race car and we build a new race car, which was that I debuted in 2011 that had all kinds of parts on it that would not work, that were not race car parts. But I was excited because they were partners that wanted to give me free parts or wanted to help me with budget. I spent most of 2011 learning that hard lesson that that free parts are never free, that, that you're still going to pay for them. And it's, it may be the really hard way with broken parts and how important it is to have the right relationship with people that have your best interest in heart and that you can work together with. I think I DNF'd almost every race in 2011 and finally partnered with Tom Kingston and Spider Tracks and partnered with King and partnered with, and I think I even, I, I did, they weren't giving me free parts, but I went out and, and bought, you know, at a discounted rate, the best parts that I could put under a race car. And, th- you know, my career started turning around and, and we started winning some races. I think we won Glen Helen or Reno or something like that right there at the end of the year and started carrying that momentum into 2012 and, and had learned all these lessons. At that point, I started that race car and then I've bought and sold and turned race cars for for quite a while now since since 2012 but that race car we built in 2011 I ended up selling it to uh, a race team up in 2000 up in uh up in northern California and they tried to race it for a year or two in 2013 but they didn't have much success with it and I bought it back for for peanuts they they tried to sell it they couldn't get rid of it and I bought it back for peanuts and in, in two, at the end of 2013, took it home, prepped it, went and won Arkansas in it at the end of 2013. And I just, man, I love that car. And then we took it back, tore it down, cut the roof off of it, fixed all the stuff, took it back to King of the Hammers and won, won in 2014 at King of the Hammers. And, you know, that race was definitely a crazy race and attrition and all, all kinds of good stuff. But um, Daryl Gray now owns that race car. Uh, he bought it there in 2014 when we finished the Red Dragon. Uh, you know, he's been racing, racing it pretty hard ever since then. So, you know, that car is going on nine, 10 years old and he's still out there beating on it and racing on it and, and winning races. I think it's the 95 is this car number? It is. Yeah. It's yeah. that red 95. No, no, 85. Oh, is it 85? Yeah. That's, there you go. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, you know, then we won King of the Hammers 2014 and and it just really kicked off the season cuz then we built the Red Dragon, came out and started racing it right then in 2014 and you know, we won almost every race we entered in that in that car for almost 2 years. Cody Addington owns it now, but that car is still would you still I think the that car's record is still the winningest car in Ultra 4 now. Is it still about right? I- I sure would think so. I mean, I'd have to look at the numbers, but I, I think it's got to be the winningest car in Ultra 4. Well, I, I should say 4,400. I know that like, uh, Savvy's Jeep truck that they that they race has probably won more. Oh, races. fair enough. Fair enough. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I class-wise. Yes, class-wise. But I think in the unlimited class, I do think it's probably the winningest car in the history for sure. And Cody's the right guy to have it right now. I mean, he's had a lot of success in it. I'm not sure why you stepped away from a, a winning, winning car. And I mean, I know you wanted to have someone sitting next to you, share your dreams and what's going on in your head during a race. Cody's been killing it. I think a lot of people love to see it when he showed up with that car. It was still red. It still looked like the dragon and he won in it. And then now it's orange. I personally would love to see Cody with a much deeper budget and be able to hit more races because he's a hell of a wheel, man. He's probably better a driver than you. <laughs> I don't know that far. No, I, I'm giving you a hard time. I don't. Uh, he, he, I just, don't. he just wrecks less than you. And yeah, it's been it's been one of those years this year with uh, with some wrecks and some tumbles. That said, and we'll get into this marketing here in a little bit, but your wrecks have been quite well documented. And luckily, Randy has built you, Randy's guys have built you cars that can certainly take a punch and just really sledgehammers. You can beat on them and they come back. What happened to you two weeks ago at Crandon? You went wheel to wheel with Casey, Casey Curry. Casey didn't hold his line. In the video, it looks like he slid out off of his line and, and tangled with you and you went for a yard sale. Yeah, I mean, it, it just was one of those racing incidents. I don't think Casey was trying to wreck me. Um, I don't know if he was trying to block my line because he, you know, his spotter was telling him I was coming through to pass on the inside. You know, racing incident, things happen. But yeah, wheel to wheel at probably 90 miles an hour. Uh, one of the more violent wrecks I've had. Luckily, didn't hit the chassis. It went to wheel and tire to suspension and, and it soaked most of it up. We had a, a long night. We worked till four in the morning slept for a couple hours and then right back onto it. And it took us probably 15 hours to get the car raceable the the next day. But, you know, we went out and pulled off a second the next day with, with half a radiator and, you know, no real confidence in my head after wrecking in practice, me making a mistake and then wreck, wrecking the, in the night race. It just, it shook my confidence and, and I just, I didn't have much for Paul that day. 
But, you know, that said, shaking your confidence is one thing, but being able to totally rely on your race car to protect yourself and protect what's going on inside your head and protect your body is, you know, huge when it comes when you're looking at, if you're looking at chassis, Jimmy should always be, it's always top of my list of, you know, safest chassis out there. Miller certainly has some nice stuff that he makes with his pro chassis, Shannon, Slauson, all those guys are making stuff that you can wad them up, you can almost kill yourself in them. The very next day, you were able to come out and put yourself on on uh, on the box. Yeah, and the evolution of of safety equipment too. I mean, we were out there racing with he- with neck rolls and hundred dollar helmets, you know, five years ago, and you know now we've got two thousand dollar carbon fiber helmets and head and neck restraints and great seats and great belts and all this stuff. So, you know, I, I did get hurt early on in in my career that safety equipment probably would have not hurt me, and now I I do have pretty good confidence that when I do take a wreck or a roll, that you know I'm gonna walk away from it not hurt. Yeah, hundred dollar helmet, hundred dollar head. Right. <laughs> right. So uh, here we are. You've won twice. You're, you've held the scepter for two separate years, you know, the early half of where we set on King of the Hammers. You haven't had a ton of success since. The Red Dragon didn't have success at KOA. Step to a two-seat car now, and you've made the decision now to leave the comfort of a full-time job with insurance and the that comfort blanket for your family and for your, your daughters. What were the metrics that allowed you to make that choice, to make that decision to step away from all that comfort and say, you know what, I'm going to do this 100% and here's the metrics that I've met or that have been met or I think are going to be met and here are the partners or the partner group that I need to team up with. Walk me through how you did that because that's a huge leap. I mean, it's a leap. Uh, yeah, no joke. I mean, you're talking about a great job and insurance and all those benefits and, and, uh, I'm going to go be a race car driver and year to year, you know, you have to resign contracts and you don't know exactly what's going to happen. But, you know, I went to all my partners and told them, this is what I want to do. You know, these are, these are the events. This is the marketing. This is the exposure. You know, this, this is what I want to do. Here's my proposal. Here's the route I want to go. And, and I'm doing both of these half assed and I, I need to be able to focus on this. And every one of them said, absolutely, we're in. We don't mind helping with more budget. Um, if you're willing to sign up for more marketing and more events and, and everybody loves racing, but the world today is different. I'm with social media and, and everything else. You know, it, it's not the, the win on Sunday, sell on Monday mentality anymore. It's, it's what's, what do you, what else are you going to be doing? What's the lifestyle stuff? How else are you going to be helping us sell our product? Because in the end, that's that's the number one goal. So, you know, it just it definitely has has changed. Still that same theory. You know, you just you have to to present the ideas and tell them the direction you're headed and and how you're going to how you're going to work with them. So when you put together your proposal, did you do that solo or did you reach out to any specialist on that? No, and I mean, a proposal is just a piece of paper and it needs to look nice and pretty and give them an idea or give them something to look back at. But it, this is all one on one, you know, meetings, flying to California to sit down with people. It's, it's definitely not something you just email over to somebody with a cold call and say, Hey, you know, I want sponsored by you. It's, it's building those relationships. It's, you know, after a race of, you know, helping them working with their team. It's, that's what it's all about and showing them the value in you. No, that's what I was trying to drill into. I think that's one thing that's missed in the guys today. They call up a company looking for parts. They ask about sponsorships, and then they settle on running a sticker for free shipping. And so a guy like you, you're competing with you know a Nitto branded car, MBRP exhaust branded car, and you're competing against a guy that you know he slapped uh, an eight by sixteen sticker on the side of his car because he got free shipping. And as a as a sponsor, as a partner, as a company out there putting my name on cars, I'm going to be like Lauren. Why do I need to give you ten grand, or why do I need to give you twenty grand when I've got Joe A, Joe B, and Joe C doing this for free shipping or a discount on parts? Yeah, absolutely. And with the amount of Ultra 4 drivers there are now, I mean, that's definitely a concern with all of us is is there are those new guys that will just do it for nothing. But the companies still understand the the difference in, in our social media and our following and our marketing. And, you know, I, I really thought I had most of this figured out, but teaming up with Von Gittin Jr. and to build the Fun Haver Off-Road team this year has really even opened my eyes, you know, a whole nother 200% on, on how this game really works. And and those guys that are that are working with you know multi million dollar budgets and and have a whole team of you know twenty five employees and and all this stuff it's we're still very very new and very very rookie in this sport. So Von Gitten, 
And so here we are, the ultimate fun haver team. Lauren is fun haver number two. How did that come to be? Many people have reached out and asked, hey, why? what's going on with Lauren's deal? You got to know the back end story on that. And I'm like, to be honest, I don't. I follow Von Gitten on social media because I, I think his drift car antics are awesome. But I jumped in because he had that uh, that Ford F-250, the, the silver one, the ultimate fun haver truck or whatever. Yep. And I was like, dude, this thing is this thing's awesome. So that's how that guy showed up in my life as just, as just a toggle on and subscribe to and follow that guy. And then he goes to Jimmy. Um, he goes to Randy and gets a Jimmy's four by four to build him this Bronco. I'm like, okay, man, this guy's throwing money at it. It, it seemed like the right evolution that you two would be partners. I just don't know what that partnership looks like. And I think a lot of uh, the people that listen in, a lot of the people in our family, in our community, they kind of have the, the same view. Like, what is Lauren getting? And the words out of my mouth have been, man, I have no idea, but it has to be marketing and Lauren has to be getting a bunch from him. So that that's fair. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's let's back up to where it started. Um, he, he was a knit or is a Nitto sponsored driver as well on the drift side. And so we would be at different events together and we just kind of clicked, you know, you, one of those people that you're, that you're friends with, that you want to hang out with and have a beer with afterwards. We just clicked. We, we have the same mentalities and, you know, we work really well together. So Nitto is sponsoring Ultra 4 and King of the Hammers, and they have a spec via, a spec car when Dave Cole was doing the spec cars at King of the Hammers. They offer up a spec car to Von Gittin Jr. Hey, you want to come out and, and try this stuff? Von's got no off-road experience, nothing at all. He shows up at King of the Hammers in, has to be 2016, to race a spec car and has, doesn't even know how to put the thing in four-wheel drive. So, you know, he shoots me a text before he gets out there. Hey, you know, do you mind showing me a little bit of the ropes? Like, I have no idea. And I'm like, dude, got you. Let's do this. So him and I go out in a spec car and we take him up the qualifying course. And, you know, he learns how to put it in four low and how to climb rocks. You know, I'm kind of teaching him all the stuff that I know and all the secrets I know and how to survive with off road. Him and I, you know, after that moment, we just we've been great friends. And it just made sense for us to team up in on the business side of it and kind of work off each other's strengths and take care of each other's weaknesses. So he didn't understand off-road, didn't understand, you know, that type of stuff. And I didn't understand marketing and media n- near the way the way that he does. You know, we we kept in touch. We kept working together. I helped him, uh, you know, answer questions with Brocky. You know, he's teamed up with Jimmy's. They're, they're handling a bunch of that stuff, too. And then at the beginning of this year, the beginning of 2019, you know, he wants to move into 4,400 class. So he's he's learned for for three years now he didn't want to come in and race right against the pros because you know as a monster sponsored athlete there's nothing good about coming out and finishing you know 20th place against all these pros that he didn't know how to compete against so he does it the right way he comes in and learns in the limited classes gets his feet wet and learns all about ultra four and king of the hammers and then he's ready to move into to the unlimited class in 4400 in 2019 and and so we sat down at SEMA last year and he's like all right here's how i want to do it i want to team up i want you to handle the prep, the logistics, everything that goes with the race car. And I want to handle all your media. You suck at media. You suck at social media. Let me fix all that for you. Let me, we have a team. I have a full-time, full-time guys that, that that's what they do every single day. This is part of your job to put this out with marketing. Let me handle that part for you. You handle my race part. And let's create the fun haver off road team and go to these big corporations and and that's the stuff that's on the table now is you know not the little industry sponsors but the, the big corporations for me and and that's what I never could do is is get out of the industry. Based on that relationship and you guys as a teaming up, you get, you're able to leverage each other's strengths. Yeah, absolutely. It's no longer a, a one Lauren and a one Von Gittin. It's uh, you get you two together and you're equivalent of one plus one equals three in this instance. Absolutely. And, you know, he's done amazing in the 4400 class this year in, in a car that was built for 4500. You know, he's sitting in the top three in the championship points. You know, he's he's got some podiums. He's done amazing. He's, he really is the only person of the crossover drivers, the trophy truck drivers, all those guys that have been able to figure out. He came in and finished top 10 this year in 4400 and King of the Hammers. No other crossover driver has ever done that. Hopefully I'll get some other crossover drivers on, but I'd love to have Vaughn on and have a conversation with him. You can take a car and get it made into a toy before you've won. Like as a king, I think he's already more successful than than anyone. And my my kid even has a you know one of those. It's a, a little Brocky. It's a little Brocky. Yep. You could buy it at Target. You could get it on Amazon. Ultra Four. You know, in the mainstream, it's because of Von Gittin. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's great for the sport. It was great for Jimmy's four by four and and our our fun have off road team. You know, the partnership's just going to continue to grow and and do really cool stuff. So so given you know re- doing really cool stuff and you know giving added value, added value back to your sponsors, getting them out into the media. Uh, one thing that you did come through with, and I know you had other little foyers, but you did Milk Run and you did that with Will Gentile and some other guys for Nitto. Let's talk about Milk Run. I know you've talked about it a million times, but how did you convince Savannah to let you run a car through your garage door? And for those that don't, don't know this, uh, this video, you can Google it up. Lauren Healy, Milk Run. It's, it's on YouTube. It starts out with Lauren crashing his race car through the garage door of his house there in, uh, Farmington and then shooting off into the desert, doing some really crazy tricks, all just to run to the convenience store and buy. It's not even a gallon of milk. It's like you got the small milk. It's <laughs> right. And what year was this? Like 2016, 2017? Yeah. Oh, a couple years ago. No, I think it, 2015, 2016, somewhere in there. And, you know, Will and I had always worked together on a bunch of other Nitto projects. He's he's the main video guy for Nitto. And we were just in Moab playing around with the race car and shooting some cool, some cool clips. We came up with some stuff out there at the Whitewash Sand Dunes, you know, me jumping off that big cliff and then doing the step up. And we showed that to Nitto and they're like, we got to do something more with this. Like these aren't just 10 minute or 10 second social media clips. Like we feel like we've done some cooler stuff. You know, we jumped down potato salad. We feel like we have some, maybe not quite as cool as BJ Baldwin recoil stuff, but we feel like we have some cool stuff for, for what we did. So, so Nitto said, okay, come up with some more of a plot line. You have to come up with, you know, nobody, everybody likes watching somebody do stupid stuff, but they're the social media videos now, you know, Chris Corbett's like, you, you've got to have a plot behind it, come up with something silly. So we're all sitting there scrolling through social media videos. And this lady in a minivan accidentally drives her, her car through a garage door on, on social media. And it, and it, everybody's sharing it and laughing about it and thinks it's hilarious. It's got like 10 million views. And we're like, all you got to do is drive your, drive a vehicle through a garage door and get 10 million views. Like that's stupid. A garage door is $2,000. Let's do it. Savannah was out of town. We didn't, we didn't even tell her. I just, you know, oh, even better. Yeah. She, she didn't even know. So, uh, we went and came to, came to my house in Farmington and, and needed to wrap up and tie some stuff together for the clips. And we, you know, we had one shot to, to drive through the garage door and, and made it happen. Uh, you know, and that turned out really cool. The video definitely went viral and, and went really well. You know, we keep threatening to, to film another one, but all our schedules are so crazy and busy and, you know, budget to to do it right you know we did that on on no budget for the most part it was kind of will and i's investment so to speak and so i I think we will get to do another one here soon but uh we'll see when bj started bj baldwin trophy truck driver he's he's a monster guy toyo guy when he came out with his recoil series it really kind of turned heads certainly leveraged social media and it just turned everyone like oh wow there's more to this giving back to my sponsors than just slapping their names on the side of my car and taking the green flag. Yeah, absolutely. No, nobody cares if that, if you're going to walk in the door and say, that's my plan, you're going to get laughed out of the office. So yeah, it, it definitely is a, is a whole different ball game these days. We had a discussion kind of, it was via text before this uh, kind of went down and we were talking about winning and sponsors. And you said you, you made a statement that winning isn't everything today. And I want to go into what fully do you mean by that? You know, I I think it's just kind of back to that thing of how how marketing is so much more important. They still want you to win win races. They're not going to go out and say, you know, don't win races, but you know, we're we're racing 8 or 10 weekends a year or even a little bit less and and it's what else are you doing the rest of the year? How are you selling our product? How are you helping us uh create a, our brand and and build it and make it better? And it is all about the other, the other stuff you're doing. You know, obviously social media is a, a huge thing that, that they're focused on right now. The marketing events, providing vehicles, you know, signing autographs, doing that type of stuff at all the SEMA, Off-Road Expo, you know, all of that stuff as well. You know, it's, it's just, it's the whole package. It's definitely not about racing on the weekends anymore. And like you said, slapping a sticker on the side of the vehicle, they, yeah, that's cool, but it's, it's not the most important thing. So I'd seen a number thrown around and this has been, you know, just through reading and through passage that most sponsors tend to look at or partners tend to look at that for every dollar they give you, they give you a dollar, Lauren, they want to be able to tie that back to say $4 in sales that that ends up, you know, inventory leaving their business. Is that is that a fair number today, or is that kind of the metrics today, or or how are they making the decision on Lauren wants us to give him twenty grand, 
can he return us 80 in sales or what does that look like? Man, I've never seen a specific number put to it like that, but I think they have to look at what's the, the ROI, what's the return on the investment, and how are you going to sell product? And you have to have a plan to be able to, to tell them how you're going to help them grow their brand and be a great uh, brand ambassador and, and help them. So. I believe your name is synonymous with, with Nitto and with MBRP. So if that says anything for those two companies, they've gotten their money at, you know, worth, worth out of you. And so maybe you need to go back to the store and say, Hey, I, I need some more money for next year because this guy over here on this podcast told me that, you know, obviously I'm settling for too little. Right. I'm, I, I am Mr. Nitto. I mean, that's Chris Corbett, but we also know that's also, you know, Lauren is synonymous with the Nitto brand. Yeah, absolutely. No, and I'm I'm super grateful for those partners. We've been with them for years and years and I think that shows that that we continue to provide them value and and give them good assets so that they want to continue to partner with us. You know, we've been with them for with Nitto since uh 2012 now. I mean, that's that's 8 or 9 years we've been with Nitto. So Definitely great, grateful for the relationships. And it's it's tough because now as everything evolves into more professional motorsports and, you know, now we have semis and now we have employees that are working for us and helping us prep the race cars and, you know, teams running our marketing like it, it does. It requires more and more budget every single year. And, you know, we keep coming up with these great ideas and, and how to how to do more and how to how to make the, the program better. And it just it requires more dollars. So to touch on that, the guys that are coming into the sport, the rookies, they were a rookie this past season or they're having a car built currently and they plan to show up uh, next year. The bar has been set very high. The barrier for entry is now quite high with guys like you who have done this for 10 years. Like you said, they've gone into not only a new car, not only understanding what parts work and what parts don't work an 18 wheeler. What advice would you give to a rookie that's showing up and a rookie that, that he's just hooked. He showed up at KOH this past year and is like, I want to line up against Lauren Healy. Uh, that's just, I mean, he's my, he's my dream. I want to line up next to him. I think I've got a shot. I want to prove it. What advice would you give a guy like that? Man, I hope you're independently wealthy because if you don't have the the marketing partners and, and the budget to do it, you better be ready to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars a year racing um, if you're wanting to run the whole season and, and be in a competitive, you know, race cars. Now I built my first real race car for fifty thousand dollars. You're not building a competitive race car for less than three hundred thousand dollars now. And, you know, they're talking some cars are five and six hundred thousand dollars. So I, I almost feel like when somebody asks me that question, I actually get asked that quite a bit. Start in one of the limit classes, start in a, in a UTV, start in, start in a 4,800 car and get your feet wet, man. Like don't come in and ruin your whole life and run everything trying to run in the, in the unlimited, the trophy trucks of the King of the Hammers type, type classes. See if you have it. See if you really want to be a driver. See if you really want to be stuck in there for eight hours at King of the Hammers getting your, getting your body beat to death before you make that huge investment and, and make sure it's something you're really passionate about and you're ready to commit you know, all your time and, and have your family upset with you because you're in the shop working on it all the time. Like just starting in a limited class now, I think is, is about the best option. There are guys that, that come in and, and have the budget to build a three or 400,000 car now and can come compete with us. I think they're, they're far and few between. I think that's a fair statement as well. And certainly in the guys that do have, it, it takes the stars to align up just correctly for a guy to show up that has the money, but also has the, the wherewithal to put up with all the time commitments and then the ability to be a wheel man. A lot of guys have checkbooks, but you think you can drive until you actually go drive. And then you're like, wow, um, I'm terrible. I'm slow. Or, wow, I got away with that. Like, I don't know how I got away with that. Like that was, that was a stupid move. L low probability move on my behalf. Uh, we're lucky we lived through that. Yep. So going forward. So here we are. This is a uh, 2019. We're looking at KOH coming up 2020. Actually, I'm even jumping way too far ahead. We've got nationals coming up. What are your plans for nationals? I know you've got some deals worked out where uh, you're short a race car currently for uh, for some deals that you have worked out. What are your plans for nationals and how does that play into what 2020 looks like for you? Yeah, no, absolutely. So Vaughn and I have a contract for the next couple of years to go over to the Riyadh Auto Show in Saudi Arabia. They saw some social media videos of us at Auto Enthusiast Day of uh, me jumping over the top of his Mustang while he's drifting it. And, and they said, we want you to come and duplicate that, that those demos for us at our auto show in Saudi Arabia. So we worked it out and figured out the logistics where we shipped my race car over. Uh, we shipped Nick Nelson's trophy truck and then a couple of Vaughn's demo drift cars. 
And we're going to be over there in November doing this this really cool festival uh, in Saudi Arabia. So uh, my race car already had to get shipped over there. We have been trying to figure out the logistics of Vaughn having a conflict. His Formula Drift Nationals is the same weekend as our Nationals, and he's in the top three in the championship points. So you're allowed to have one substitute driver through the year. So as teaming up with Fun Haver Off Road Team uh, at Nationals, I'll be driving his. I'll be driving Brocky as his substitute driver and trying to help him uh, get somewhere in the championship. Oh, so solid, solid. And then your car will be back in time. In theory, it should be back in time for KOH. It'll be back in December. Also looking at uh, having Jimmy's build me a new chassis right now. In fact, uh, first thing tomorrow mon- morning, I'm headed up to Jimmy's to, to talk to Randy to talk about having a new chassis and possibly have a new car ready to go for, for King of the Hammers. Um, we've got some cool new Ford motors being built right now to uh, to start racing on. So uh, definitely want to integrate that into the program a little bit. That's a drop. Wow. That's, you can't sneak big information like that in at the very end. So you're moving away from the GM LS platform for a Ford crate style. Definitely not a Ford crate style. It's, it's a, uh, it's a, a D motor platform, uh, pretty much the same thing that Croyer and Dugans and everybody, uh, builds their trophy truck Ford motors with. Same platform that we're, we're moving over to. Well, I only said crate motor because that's what everyone says is in a uh, Brocky Von Gittin's car. That it's just this crate motor, but it's substantially not. It has been up until two races ago. It was a 427 performance Ford motor that you can order from anybody online. You can Google it. They're like $15,000, not 60000 like the motors that we have. And so after King of the Hammers, he ran it at King of the Hammers with that 427 crate motor in it. And he said, all right, you know, for the rest of the season, when we're short course racing and stuff, I need a little, I need, I need some more motors. So we sent it to Mike Cash, who helps him with his drift program a little bit. And he, you know, he massaged the motor and, and got it up to about 700 horse, which, you know, it was 600 or so before that. So he does have a little bit more motor now, but it's definitely not on par at all with, with the big LS motors that me and Shannon and uh, some of the other right. guys are running for sure. When you look at Ford and look at the Ford motor program, so I run a, I run a Roush Yates motor in a land speed car and it makes perfect. My motor is actually a Kuzlowski motor and it's 850 horse and it's right there in the box. And it's, it's so much cheaper than an LS motor, but it's 850. It has all of NASCAR dyno time behind it, engineering time behind it and dump it in the car. 850 horse and I can go to Bonneville and run, you know, in the high two hundreds in my car with it. I've won. I've often wondered why we haven't made that transition. Certainly in ultra four, everyone is hung with the LSs. If I were to ever get back in the game, I know exactly what I would do. I would call Roush Yates and grab another one of those motors. Cause they're, you know, they're almost throwaway motors once they come from NASCAR and they're still making 850 horsepower. So that's, we're talking about 300, 400, $500,000 cars, but we're talking $60,000 LS motors and you can get into these, uh, Roush Yates motor program for so much cheaper in a Ford motor. Uh, it seems right. crazy. I, I don't know why it's happening. I see you've, uh, you, I see the smile on your face right now on camera that you, uh, you've found that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm very excited about it and and looking forward to, you know, just something a little bit different. And then Ultra 4 everything's been monkey see monkey do and everybody kind of follows the footsteps of what the leaders are doing and you know, this will be a little bit different. It may take a little bit of a learning process, but um definitely excited to uh to to make the transition over. Well, when you see how expensive the the mistakes are to make and how expensive the the learning curve truly is, yeah, it, it makes sense. You know, I had Casey Gilbert on. You know, people have heard his episode uh, before they hear yours, and we'll have heard. You know, he leverages Miller Motorsports for a lot of his R and D, and you know, Eric and his crew have put in a, a, a ton of work, so he hasn't had to recreate some of the the mistakes. You, you, uh, you learned a lot of mistakes and bumps and bruises along the way, and here you are sitting today professional race car driver walked away from a very very comfortable job to do this and put on three different hats or four different hats and i know you raced ridgecrest yesterday you wrecked a a, a utv yesterday then you drove all the way home from ridgecrest california to farmington to have a conversation with me this morning lauren thank you thank you yeah absolutely i mean that's this was my only day in the calendar this this uh this month that i had some free time um you know, it's back to work on Monday. I'm headed to Moab to do some social media video um, stuff. And so I'll be there all next week. It's uh, my schedule is insane right now. I, I never hustled as hard as I am right now. I've never had to work as hard as I am right now, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity and, and always open to, to doing fun stuff. So 
Man, you're such an approachable guy too. That's really one thing that I, I learned about you and liked about you all the way back to 2010 is no matter what event I've been at or I've been able to see you with a crowd of fans, you're signing stuff. You always find time out of your schedule to talk to them. You always have a smile on your face. Maybe that's the Olive Garden in you. I don't know, but you <laughs> always have the smile. Yeah. Lauren, thanks for coming on. Yeah, no, absolutely. Anytime, man. I'm grateful to talk about Ultra 4 and talk about the path that we've gotten to. And and hopefully uh, it continues to grow and, and the sport continues to grow and it turns into this big, big idea we all have in our head. Well, good luck in 2020, okay? Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you for listening and taking a dive into The Talent Tank. Please like and subscribe on Instagram at The Talent Tank or our website, thetalenttank.com.